Welcome to another episode of Trial Site News. On today's show, we're going to be discussing news out of Israel. A study appears to be showing negligible temporal protection of Pfizer's mRNA vaccine against viral transmission. The study authors suggest that there is a need for reassessment of future booster campaigns based on their findings. So we're going to discuss what is going on here. And so, from Trial Site News, I am Adrian, and our episode is starting right now. Israeli researchers represented by corresponding author Nama Koppelman from Holland Institute of Technology, Department of Computer Science, and scientists from the Clinical Microbiology and Epidemiology Departments in Sheba Medical Center conducted a retrospective study combining population-wide national vaccination data along with cycle threshold data derived from four major Israeli laboratories, which were conducting SARS-CoV-2 PCR tests in a bid to measure not only vaccine effectiveness, which is usually measured by protection from infection, clinical disease, or death, but also the potential risk of transmission given infection. Now, this latter element, however, has often been neglected during the COVID-19 pandemic, and it represents a serious topic for public health policy concern and the reduction of viral spread, which negatively correlates in testing with cycle threshold values, or CT as I'll refer to it for the rest of this video, in quantitative real-time polymerase chain reaction, otherwise known as QRT-PCR. Now, in this study, the team of scientists investigated the important measurement of risk of transmission given infection by factoring the viral load, which negatively correlates in testing with cycle threshold, or CT, values in quantitative real-time polymerase chain reaction. A readily available surrogate to estimate infectiousness, the CT values associated with the SARS-CoV-2 PCR tests were the basis for this retrospective study comparing CT levels of individuals in Israeli vaccinated with two, three, or even four doses versus COVID-19 recovered individuals. Now, limitations aside, the findings we see here are troubling. They raise imminent questions about any booster dose campaigns moving forward. With an emphasis on the mRNA vaccine produced by Pfizer BioNTech, the team reports that whether it's the two dose primary series, third dose booster during Delta or Omicron, or the fourth dose for elderly and at risk, the duration of benefit as considered in protection against viral transmission is short lived. Now, given the enormous public expenditure, this performance calls for the need to reassess the future of booster campaigns. This, according to the study authors. So let's talk about the background of this study. Koppelman and colleagues first established that based on the available data on studies during the Delta variant, vaccinated individuals were recorded as having higher CT, meaning lower viral load, which means they were less ineffective and that this effect wanes as time unfolds. In this study, the investigators sought to add to the evidence by evaluating Omicron CT as compared to vaccination and recovery statuses. In this context, how does CT change with time since vaccination slash infection based on rich nationwide QRT PCR data? Well, the authors would point out that the quote, waning effect of infection induced protection has not been thoroughly analyzed before in terms of CT and infectivity. So now let's take a look at the study and break it down. Importantly, this study team sought to measure actual vaccine effectiveness as measured by transmissibility. This factor obviously has major implications for public health policies. What about core assumption for the study? Well, CT value is a common surrogate for viral load and infectiousness. As for data, four molecular labs, including two from Israeli Health Maintenance Organization, representing approximately 40% of the Israeli population, and two labs credentialed for the Israeli Ministry of Health, the PCR tests are associated with the MOH mass surveillance scheme. And then, of course, the question arises, how do they analyze the data? Well, they tapped into the rich data organized by protocol. They conducted multivariate linear regression analysis on CT values applied across Delta and Omicron variants vaccination status, and numerous other data elements, which then leads us to the findings. 
The study authors reported that regarding the Delta surge, a primary series or two dose noticeably decreases viral load, clearly evidenced by the decrease between the unvaccinated CT level and that of the early two dose, meaning 10 to 39 days. The two dose vaccine cohort evidenced success with a measurement of 1.54 CT unit higher than the unvaccinated, leading to a threefold decrease in viral load. However, this didn't last long. According to the study authors, they said that, quote, the protection wanes rapidly as time elapses since vaccination, and CT reaches a level similar to that of the unvaccinated by day 70. So what then about the three-dose vaccination, I hear you ask? Well, this group evidences an even higher surge in protection, yet once again rapid waning follows, and by day 70, CT reaches the baseline level of the unvaccinated. And then of course, we have the Omicron variant. A third dose booster bumps CT among the vaccinated and is comparable to infection-derived protection. However, the authors point out that the differences in CT for the unvaccinated two-dose and late three-dose groups are negligible. They said that, in general, the effect of immune status for Omicron is less pronounced than for Delta, even upon recent receipt of the third vaccine dose or a previous infection, as manifested by reduced CT value gaps between these groups and the unvaccinated. The relative difference between the recently vaccinated three dose 10 to 39 days and the unvaccinated is smaller in Omicron compared to Delta. Similarly, the relative difference between recovered and unvaccinated is 1.69 in Delta, while in Omicron it is reduced to 0.78. These gaps are reduced by a two-fold in Omicron, possibly due to host immune waning and viral evasion. So now that takes us to the fourth booster dose. Again, this was administered mostly to the elderly, thus necessitating a separate analysis. The authors reported that shortly after the administration of the fourth dose, CT of the vaccinated individuals, eight, those over 60, reaches levels similar to those of recovered individuals and significantly higher than those of the unvaccinated two and three doses from the same age group, indicating at least a short-term vaccine effectiveness of the vaccine in reducing CT level. So, for at least a month, the fourth dose did offer protection against confirmed infection and severe illness. But again, the duration of this protection is short-lived. Okay, so we have the results here. What are the implications of the study? Well, based on this analysis of a comprehensive set of national data, the Israeli investigators found that, quote, overall, the presumed vaccination-related immunity to SARS-CoV-2 has only a negligible long-term effect on CT value. Again, the surrogate used for viral load and infectiousness, the Israeli researchers reminded all that the, quote, combination of vaccine waning and vaccine evasion are the most likely drivers of this finding. And they went on to say that this study mandates reevaluating the role of current vaccination campaigns in harnessing the potential infectivity of COVID-19 at a time scale of over two months. Furthermore, the study authors suggested that the decision makers need to balance the following. First, judicious use of vaccine resources. Second, decreasing disease burden, especially in high-risk populations. And third, and finally, false reassurance and promiscuous behavior due to the short-lived sterilizing immunity. Otherwise, the authors caution that these factors may deem vaccine campaigns as counterproductive epidemiologic restriction measures without proper communication with the public. So what are the key takeaways from the authors? Well, a key factor in evaluating the commitment of time, capital, and resources for future booster vaccine programs must factor in details such as levels of prevention and reduction of transmission, assessment of durability of protection, severity of disease, as well as mortality. Now, as ever always, there are limitations to this study. While PCR efficiency is likely comparable for the Delta and Omicron variants, the authors suggested caution in comparing CT values between variants and rather center attention on within variant comparisons. Another limitation is lab-specific standards, which can limit CT value findings. And finally, temporal biases are possible due to changing policies and health-seeking behaviors. So before we wrap up this story, the question should be asked. Where does the WHO currently stand on the issue of booster shots? Well, as of May 17th of this year, the World Health Organization, with the support of the strategic advisory groups of experts, otherwise known as SAGE, on immunization and its COVID-19 vaccines working group, is continuing to review the emerging evidence on the need for and timing of additional booster doses 
for the currently available COVID-19 vaccines, which have received emergency use listing, otherwise known as EUL. They, the WHO, as of now, are still recommending at least some booster doses on the basis that, quote, booster doses should be offered based on evidence that doing so would have substantial impact on reducing hospitalization, severe disease, and death, and to protect health systems. Now, this, of course, leads us to the question, will the WHO change their stance with this new emerging data? Well, of course, only time will tell. And naturally, we'll be keeping an eye on it as it continues to develop. And that, my friends, will bring our episode to a close once more. As always, thank you so much for joining me on the program today. From Trial Site News, I am Adrian, and I will see you all next time.